Thank you to each who has been a part of our worship experience, those of you who've led today. Thank you so very much. He was asked the question, what did he miss most? He had lost his vision. It had been a, an illness that had grown into infection and before it could be halted, he no longer could see. He said he missed the colors and he missed the faces. We take so much for granted our vision among those things which we just assume. When we think about what it means to see, we look at a world and we can notice a lot. We can notice a lot of things that are wrong, a lot of things that need to be changed, a lot of things that need our attention. When we talk about ultimate things, we sometimes realize how often we can fall into the trivial. What's most important? What is it we're supposed to see? Be thou my vision. Oh, if we could see as God sees, what would that be like? Today we're going to talk a little bit about heaven. We've never seen heaven. We've seen things that remind us of it or at least give us the promise of it. Those can be seen in our world today. We can see the handiwork of God. We can realize that there is a brilliant mind and a wonderful heart behind all of creation. We can sense that we're not here by accident, that this just didn't happen, that our lives have to have purpose. There must be meaning. If not, why do we continue on? Today, Jesus, in the passage we're going to look at, Jesus is trying to help his disciples gain a new vision. He wants them to see what's possible. And maybe today there's someone here who needs to see the possible. Open your Bibles with me to the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. John is the fourth of the Gospels in the New Testament. In all probability, the last to be written. It differs just a bit from the three that are before it because it takes a little different tact. It has a different meaning and purpose in the author's mind. He, he wants to clearly demonstrate that Jesus Christ has the answer for this life and the life to come. And that by believing in what Christ did and who he is, you and I might have life, not just an abundant life here, a meaningful life here, but life forever. Listen to the word of God. This is from the New Living Translation, John chapter 14, verse 1. Don't be troubled. You trust God. Now, trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's home and I am going to prepare a place for you. If this were not so, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know where I'm going and how to get there. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We haven't any idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had known who I am, then you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Philip, don't you even yet know who I am? Even after all the time I have been with you, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking to see him? You see, Jesus is talking about vision. He's talking about what you and I see and what we see 
should matter. Everybody has an idea about heaven. Some dis discount the whole idea, don't believe that it's possible. This is all there is to it. Once you live this life, it's done. You, you just do the best you can and then you're just history. Most people believe in heaven. Among the various religious groups, we do share a common idea that there's something to be said about an afterlife. Someone asked me one time, this thing about heaven, it's just not possible because how could all the people who've ever lived fit into some place called heaven? Well, let's just pursue this idea of room for everybody. Today in the world, we're approaching 8 billion people. Those numbers are augmented by a guesstimate of how many people have ever lived, which would take it somewhere over 100 billion. How in the world could you put that many people in a, in a place? Well, if you want to go a little further than that, you want to know what uh, that place looks like, you can go to the book of Revelation, and it actually gives us dimensions for the place. And the Bible describes this new creation, this all things being made new, new heavens and new earth. Is there room for everybody? Well, it reminds me a little bit of the disciples when challenged by Jesus to feed that huge crowd. They said, There's, we don't have enough money. We can't buy enough food. Jesus seemed to be able to take care of that, even though the disciples had brought them only a small lunch from a little boy. Sometimes we see with eyes that are limited, with an awareness of what we can gather, what we can understand. We continue to try to put God in some kind of box and limit him. Do any of us have any idea how extensive, how incredibly immense the universe is? And you're telling me that a God who created all that can't figure out how to stuff everybody that needs to go to heaven. I believe there's room for everybody. I think the question is, is there room for me? I think there are a couple of basics here. First of all, there's a conviction. It's a starting point, and that is a, a sense, a belief, a conviction that God made you. And why would God create you? Just to put another number in the book? Because he's bored looking for, for something to do, and he thought he'd come up with somebody unique, so he made you. No, he made you for a purpose because he desired a personal relationship with you. The Bible speaks of that. That there is this desire on the part of the creator to engage us personally. He doesn't look at a, a mass, he looks at a face. He sees you, he knows you, he knows everything that you go through. He knows your thoughts, he knows your desires, he knows your strengths, he knows your weaknesses. He knows everything there is to know about you. The thing that tempers his knowledge is his incredible love for you. A love that was demonstrated in the gift of his own son. Not just to come and live among us and show us how it's done. He, he went far beyond that. God sent his son to die. He sent his son to pay a price that no one else could pay. He sent his son to accept the punishment that you and I deserve. He didn't stop there. He made provision for you to live with him forever. Why, Jesus? Surely there are other ways for this to be figured out. According to John 14, there isn't. Jesus himself said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. What does Jesus have to do with this? Well, let's back up a minute and just revisit some of the words that Jesus spoke that night. Remember, he's on his way to the cross. This is not just another lesson. This is not just another time with the boys. 
He's about to go to Calvary. He's about to experience an agonizing, brutal death. His concern, as we see here in this 14th chapter of John, is not for himself. Oh, what's going to happen to me? His concern is for those 11 men in that room. Now, to put this in proper context, these guys are confused. They're scared. They're not certain what's going on. Do you know that over 25 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus has told them about eternal life. He's told them about heaven. He's told them about what he's going to be doing to see to it that they have a way to get there. They're still confused. Thomas shows this in his question. Jesus has already told them. Have you ever had to tell somebody something more than once? If you're a parent... Once, twice, three times, you're just getting started, right? Uh, teachers and preachers, they, they get this too. Jesus has told these guys what to expect. He said it publicly on more than three occasions. He's told everybody this is what's going to happen. It still didn't sink in. These guys are confused. They're not sure what to make of all this. And Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You can trust God. You can also trust me. He believed that. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to 11 men who in just a matter of hours will turn and run, who in each of their own way, his own way, will deny Christ. These are not guys who just kind of suck it up and think, well, I can take this on. No, they don't do that. They run. And Jesus is saying these beautiful words, what Martin Luther called the most comforting sermon in all the Bible. And they will desert him. Do not be troubled. Don't let your heart fail you. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Now why would they do that? Why would they believe in Jesus? Why would you believe in Jesus? I mean, after all, can't you just be good? Try not to do the bad stuff. And when it's all said and done, your good's going to be better than your bad. And surely you'll get a break because you've tried. You're a good person. There's only one problem with that. None of us can be that good. We can't overcome the fact that we've been affected by sin. The sin that entered the world and marred beautiful creation. Opened the door for death and sickness and evil created a chasm between a holy God and sinful humanity. Sin took something that was beautiful and made it ugly. And the chasm existed. And the folks over here on this side, humanity, they couldn't figure a way to get across the chasm because they couldn't build a bridge based on their deeds, their performance, their good goodness. For all is sin and come short of the glory of God. The best we could do is reach part way, but then we would fall. So how are you going to bridge the chasm? If our best efforts fall short, how do you bridge the gap? The only way to do it was through someone who wasn't affected, tainted, contaminated, polluted by sin. The only one you can describe that way, the only one who measures up, the only one who fits that job description is the one who lived without sin. The Bible teaches that that person was Jesus himself, the Son of God, 
his father sent to us. Jesus was on mission. He had a vision, his father's vision. He continually stayed in touch with his father to make sure his, his vision was clear. And there were so many distractions and so many temptations and so many moments when he could have swayed, he could have gotten off mission, but he stayed on course. Luke chapter nine, it says, Jesus set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem. He'd been to Jerusalem before. Why was that one so important? Why did he resolutely set his face to Jerusalem? Because he was on mission. He had a vision for what his father wanted him to do and he was not gonna be stopped. Your eternity, my eternity, every person you've ever known, their eternity, dependent on his staying on mission, his completing the vision. So he became the sacrifice. With all of the power at his command, all the authority that had been granted to him, He laid down the crown of gold that he deserved and put on a crown of thorns that you and I did deserve. You know, part of our, our problem is that sometimes we're just not, not honest with ourselves. A few years ago, there was a, a conference in Atlanta. The American Heart Association met over 300,000 doctors and researchers and other medical personnel. We're here attending plenary and breakout sessions on a variety of topics. One of the reporters who's covering the event decided to hang around at mealtime to see what these medical professionals ate for lunch. The last big session had been offered before the break was a seminar on heart healthy nutrition. So the reporter noticed that the attendees were at the restaurants around the convention center eating the same kind of artery clogging food that the seminar had preached against. The reporter approached the cardiologist and asked, Aren't you concerned that your bad eating habits will be a bad example? The doctor replied, oh, not me, I took my name badge off. (laughs) Jesus, Jesus kept his own. Remember that placard they nailed over his head on the cross? That was his name badge. Pilate was trying to make a statement. He was trying to put the Jewish leadership in their place, but he was also trying to exert authority over the man who had told him, the only reason why you have authority is that it's been granted from from above. He never lost sight of who he was and what he was supposed to do. He drew a line in the sand. You remember the story in the Texas lore about the Alamo in 1836. Surrounded by the Mexican troops of Santa Ana. Small force were trapped inside that Spanish mission. And famously, supposedly, Colonel William Barrett Travis calls his men together, pulls his sword out and draws a line in the sand. It says, to those who are gathered there, if you're prepared to give your life in freedom's cause, come over to me. There's a line in the sand, and only one person could cross it. On that occasion, supposedly everybody stepped over the line, including Colonel Jim Bowie had to be carried over the line. 
But only one person could cross that line. If you're prepared to pay the penalty for the price of sin, step over this line. And Jesus did that. He became the bridge. That's what he meant. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wasn't bragging. He wasn't making some empty claim. He was simply stating a fact. If you want what God has provided, what God has prepared, you have to step over this line. You have to believe. You have to believe that what I did, I did for you. You know what? I I happen to believe that if only one of us needed such a sacrifice, he still would have done it because you matter that much to him. What would happen if we arrived at heaven's doors and Jesus hadn't spoken for us? Some of you may remember the stories about one of the great American evangelists, D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody. He was scheduled to appear in London at one of the important churches of the city. A little boy named Jeffrey lived in the slums of London. He spent his days begging for food, stealing food, searching through trash cans, doing anything he could just to try to survive. Well, he, he saw a, a poster handbill in the garbage. And on the handbill were some pictures One was a picture of this rather distinguished looking man. And there was a picture of a church. He didn't recognize the man, he did recognize the church even though it was clear across London. He didn't read very well, in fact he could hardly read at all. But he knew his numbers and he could tell that these two must be doing something together. And he wanted to, he'd never seen a guy like that. So he decided he was going to go. He made his way across the city. And he found the church. It was located in a very nice area of town. Up on a hill. Beautiful, beautiful building. Stained glass windows. Impressive spire. The little boy said, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to hear that guy. And he made his way up to the door. And just as he reached out for the handle on this massive wooden door, somebody grabbed him. It was a doorman who looked at his shabby, ragged condition and said, where do you think you're going? He says, I want to go in there. I want to hear this man supposed to come. He said, you're not going in there. You're too dirty to go inside. So, Because he was used to using his wits, he tried every other door he could find, and all of them were secured. He was defeated. Came back to the front, went down, sat on one of the steps in front of that imposing building. In just a few minutes, a carriage pulled up, and you probably know where this is going. Man got out of the carriage. And he looked at this little boy over here, and the boy was a mess, tears streaming down his face. He didn't look down. He's looking straight down at his feet. The man walked over to him and said, son, what's the matter? He still wouldn't look up. He said, they won't let me in. They say, I'm not welcome here. The man said, okay, you come with me. He grabbed the little boy by the hand. He marched up the stairs. This time the doorman didn't hold up a hand or try to stop. He swung the door open. The man took the little boy by the hand, walked him down, marched him all the way down to the front of the sanctuary, sat him in the front row, said, you stay right there. You can imagine that people were watching because the man who had him by the hand was D.L. Moody himself. And the only way that little boy got in was because D.L. Moody took him by the hand and said, you're coming with me. If we're really honest with ourselves, no way we get in that door. 
It's just too dirty. It's just too dirty right here. Sin's done that to you and to me. How in the world will we have any hope? Because the hand that takes ours is the hand that bears the wounds, the scars, and the sacrifice he paid at the cross. And he takes us by the hand because he's already prepared a room for you. It's got your name on it. There's a place for you in the Father's house. There's room for you. Because of the love that God has for you, demonstrated by his son, who wouldn't dare think of heaven without you. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you can come to the Father. Come along with me. How about it? You say, that's old news. I settled that a long time ago. Well, let me ask you, if you went to a sumptuous feast in the nicest of quarters and the food there on the buffet tables was just about to break the tables because of the plenty that's there, the abundance of the feast, and you look around and you're the only one there, that'd be kind of a waste. What I mean, you'd get filled, but what about all the other people who could enjoy this? Isn't there somebody you know who ought to come to the feast? Isn't there someone who needs to hear perhaps from you? a friend, a family member, a colleague, a classmate. I want to tell you about the guy who took me by the hand and said I could go with him. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When's the last time you told them what could happen if they would take his hand? Isn't it time we had that kind of vision? Isn't it time We had that kind of heart. Let's bow together and pray. Father, in this big old sanctuary, there's relatively few of us. But there's enough power, as we sang earlier, there's enough power and love and grace to make a difference in this world. Oh, Father, help us to see what you see. Be thou our vision. Help us to be good stewards of our time, our talent, our treasure. Help us to open our eyes and hearts to the people around us who don't feel worthy or welcome. Some who don't even know how much they need what we could share with them. Dear Father, move this church. Shake us up. Help us to move past our comfort and complacency to realize this world's not headed to a good place. But we have light, light that needs to be shared in the darkness. And that light is not something we produce. It's the reflection of your love in us and through us. Oh, God, use us. Help us as we're faithful. Clear up our vision. And help us do what you called us to do, what you created us to do. Be your children. And show others where we have found our love. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In these last few moments, I ask you to consider how glorious heaven will be. I don't know if you're ready to go today, but one of these days, your time, my time will come. Before that time comes, I think you and I know we have work to do. Build up the kingdom of God. The place we start is right here at Wyuka. Perhaps today you came in here and maybe you've been visiting for a while. You're thinking about, well, maybe this is the place. Maybe I can put my life here and serve God and reach out to others. We give an invitation at our church. We invite you to come and be a part of what God's doing here. Perhaps the most important decision has yet to be made in your life, and that is what are you going to do with Christ? He's already proven how he feels about you. Now you get to prove how you feel about him. We're going to sing a song. I'm going to be right here at the front. If you have a decision you're making or thinking about praying over, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Maybe today is the time for you to pray for somebody that's in your neighborhood or office or 
or school, whatever it might be, there's somebody that needs you to take more of an interest in them because they need to hear about heaven. We're going to sing a great hymn of heaven, hymn number 524, We're Marching to Zion. Let's sing, sing it with some power here. Come and stand with me. Join me here at the front if you would. Let's continue to worship.